Okay. Well, welcome everyone to uh, the Hewlett Woodmere Library's presentation called The Stonewall Heritage. My name is Dr. Bill Fairfelder, as you heard, and I'll be your host today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a retired professor of arts and humanities who currently lives in Portland, Oregon, where I'm a lecturer, writer, and artist. I also return regularly to my hometown of New York City, where I continue my work as a docent, fossil explainer, and special projects editor. Now, because we can't possibly uh, fit everything into a 75 to 80 minute presentation, I invite you to go to my website, makingwings.net, and visit deeper dive number 97. Now, normally at this point, I would demonstrate that to you, but unfortunately, there seems to be a problem with the website today. So just go to makingwings.net, and when you do, you will see in the upper right corner a little hamburger menu, a little three little lines. You just click on that, and that will give you a drop down menu. And you'll see that one of the choices is like deeper dive number. And I think it's like 80 to 100 or something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> just click on that and go to number 97. And that will give you all kinds of material about today's program web resources, both in print and in video, suggested books, and so forth. And indeed, <clears throat> one of the things that you will see if you go to my website is recommended media. And I highly recommended what I'm about to show you, three books, all of which came out in 2019 as part of the 50th anniversary of Stonewall commemorations. Uh, Martin Duberman's Stonewall, the New York Public Library's collection of essays and articles called The Stonewall Reader, and Gail Pittman's The Stonewall Riots, Coming Out in the Streets, which uh, can be read by young readers as well as adults. These are really superb introductions to the history and the heritage of Stonewall. Now, if you would rather view the history, and then I suggest a brilliant documentary from 1984 that's recently been restored uh, called Before Stonewall. It was uh, first shown on PBS, but can now be seen as a DVD or streamed on several platforms, including Amazon Prime and YouTube. Um, and there's also a documentary called After Stonewall, uh, which uh, takes you to uh, the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, they're both excellent. Now, also available on Amazon and the PBS website, if you're a member, is uh, Stonewall Uprising, which was originally aired on PBS as part of its American Experience series in 2010. And finally, um, a very fine uh, fictional uh, film uh, is simply called Stonewall. Um, it, it's a British-American comedy drama that was released in 1995, uh, and it's actually a very reasonably accurate portrayal of the event itself with some very engaging characters. Well, let's begin and discuss what we will and won't be doing today. Um, now, just look at all those letters on your screen. Every one of them, including that plus sign at the end, represents a group of fellow human beings who have experienced all levels of rejection and acceptance by their respective cultures and religions across untold centuries. Now, there is no way that I can tell all of these remarkable and rich stories today. But what I can do as an out and proud gay man myself is tell you a little about the events that led up to one of the pivotal experiences in human and civil rights, the Stonewall Riots of late June 1969. Now, first, uh, let's acknowledge that our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, 
has always displayed a wide variety of sexual expressions. So, as you can see on this cave petroglyph, whether you lived in Neolithic times or in ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the Han Dynasty, medieval Europe, medieval India, or even medieval Thailand, many people knew what it was like to be LGBTQ+, even if they didn't have the words to describe those actions, feelings, or orientations. But today, we're going to focus on the United States. Starting in the early 20th century, uh, we'll look at a few of the many things that led up to the summer of 1969. And then after that, we'll look at some of the events that have happened as a result of Stonewall. So let's begin with a caveat. The following dozen or so highlights of America's march towards Stonewall represent only a small portion of the saga of brave men and women in America and around the world who endured countless examples of uh, injustice, uh, humiliation, violence, and even death. There's no way that I can tell this rich history, this history of my community, uh, in such a brief program. So I hope you'll forgive any omissions and perhaps share your own stories, if you choose, uh, during the Q&A period at the end. So with that said, let's look at some highlights of American LGBTQ plus history. And we begin in 1924. The Society for Human Rights established in Chicago was granted an official state of Illinois charter in December of 1924 making it the oldest documented homosexual organization in the nation. Founder Henry Gerber also produced the first American publication for homosexuals, a newsletter that he called Friendship and Freedom. In 1925, just a few months after being officially chartered by Illinois, members of the group, including Gerber, were arrested on obscenity charges the result of a tip provided by one of the members' wives. Though the charges were eventually dropped, the legal fees bankrupted Gerber and the scandal cost him his job with the US Postal Service. As a result, the group was forced to disband before it could fully embark on its mission to promote tolerance and understanding of homosexuality. Despite its brief existence and its small size, uh, the Society for Human Rights is recognized today as the first homosexual rights organization in the United States, a precursor to the modern gay liberation movement uh, that would not come about until three decades later. In 2015, Gerber's home was actually designated as a national historical landmark. Now in 1948, Biologist and sex researcher Alfred Kinsey and his assistants published the landmark book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. From his research, Kinsey concluded that homosexual behavior is not restricted to people who identify themselves as homosexual, and that at least 37% of all men have enjoyed homosexual activities at least once in their lifetime. Kinsey followed up this research with the e equally provocative book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female in 1953, which described similar same-sex encounters among women. Now, why, while psychologists and psychiatrists in the 1940s considered homosexuality a form of illness, the findings of the Kinsey report surprised many and challenged conservative notions about sexuality. Let's say in 1948, 
The great American writer Gore Vidal published his groundbreaking novel called The City and the Pillar. It became the first post-World War II novel whose openly gay and well-adjusted protagonist was not killed off at the end of the story for defying social norms. It became the first of many divisive books by Vidal that championed the gay community. Vidal's novel joined other classics of LGBTQ plus literature, including Juna Barnes' Nightwood from 1936, Carson McCullers' Reflection in a Golden Eye from 1941, and Truman Capote's Other Voices, Other Rooms, also from 1948. Uh, these four novels that you see on your screen finally brought the stories of the LGBTQ plus community into the mainstream. Now, on November 11th of 1950, in Los Angeles, gay rights activist Harry Hay, who lived from 1912 to 2002, founded America's first sustained national gay rights organization it, in an attempt to change public perception of homosexuality, the Mattachine Society aimed to, quote unquote, eliminate discrimination, derision, prejudice, and bigotry, to assimilate homosexuals into mainstream society, and to cultivate the notion of an ethical homosexual culture. But a month after the formation of the Mattachine Society on December the 15th of 1950, the United States Senate distributed a report titled Employment of Homosexuals and Other Sex Perverts in Government to All Members of Congress. The report was the result of a covert operation run by the federal government uh, that, uh, that uh, had investigated employee sexual orientation at the beginning of the Cold War. The report stated that since homosexuality was considered a mental illness by, medical, by the medical community, homosexuals constitute security risks to the nation because those who engage in overt acts of perversion lack the emotional stability of normal persons. So yeah, that's a direct quote from the um, uh, from the uh, that particular document. I've got to have to work around something that just popped up on the screen. Okay, there we are. Uh, this ongoing witch hunt continued for years, heightened by the work of Senator Joseph McCarthy who made accusations of communist infiltration into the State Department and the administration of uh, President Harry S. Truman, the Voice of America, and the U.S. Army. He also used various charges of communism, communist sympathies, disloyalty, or sex crimes to attack a number of politicians and other individuals inside and outside the government. This included a so-called lavender scare movement against suspected homosexuals. Since homosexuality was prohibited by law at that time, it was perceived to increase a gay person's risk for blackmail, among other things. Over the war and post-war years, more than 5,000 gay men and women were discharged from the military and hundreds of men and women were fired from their jobs with the government. In April of 1952, the American Psychiatric Association joined uh, this, uh, I don't know, this, uh, this experience uh, by listing homosexuality as a quote unquote, sociopathic personality disturbance, unquote in its first publication of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Immediately following the manual's release, many professionals in medicine, mental health, and social sciences criticized the categorization due to lack of empirical and scientific data. 
Unfortunately, the designation in the DSM remained on the books for over two decades until 1973. Now, as a direct result of the Psychiatric Association's edict and the rampant McCarthyism sweeping the country, on April the 27th of 1953, President Dwight Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450, banning homosexuals from working for the federal government or any of its private contractors. The order lists homosexuals as security risks along with alcoholics and other so-called quote-unquote neurotics. Well, let's move on to something a little more positive. The Daughters of Belitis, also called the DOB, or simply the Daughters, was the first lesbian civil and political rights organization in the nation. The Daughters were formed by Del Martin, seen on the far left of your screen, and Phyllis Lyon on the far right of your screen, along with other lesbian activists in San Francisco in September of 1955. The organization was conceived as a social alternative to lesbian bars, which were subject to raids and police harassment. As the daughters gained members, their focus shifted uh, to providing support to women who were afraid to come out. The organization educated them about their rights and about gay history, and for a number of years, published a magazine called The Ladder. The noted lesbian historian Lillian Faderman declared, its very establishment in the midst of witch hunts and police harassment was an act of courage, since members always had to fear that they were under attack, not because of what they did, but merely because of who they were. The Daughters, which endured until its last chapter closed in 1995, 40 years, became an invaluable educational resource for lesbians, gay men, researchers, and mental health professionals. Now, on August 30th of 1956, the American psychologist, Evelyn Hooker, shared her paper, The Adjustment of the Male Overt Homosexual, at the American Psychological Association Convention in Chicago. What she reported was the beginning of a game-changing perception of LGBTQ plus people by medical professionals and non-professionals alike. Hooker asserted that after administering psychological tests, such as the Rorschach, to groups of homosexual and heterosexual males, her research concluded that homosexuality is not a clinical entity and that heterosexuals and homosexuals did not differ significantly. Hooker's research became very influential, and she remained a leading LGBTQ plus ally and advocate until her death at the age of 89. Uh, what I've just put up on your screen, uh, there you can see her waving. Uh, there she is, the Grand Marshal at the 1986 Los Angeles Gay Pride Parade. On January the 13th of 1958, in a landmark case, One Inc. versus Olson, the United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of the First Amendment rights of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender magazine called One, One, the homosexual magazine. The suit was filed after the U.S. Postal Service and the FBI declared the magazine contained obscene material. But the court said uh, that the magazine wasn't obscene and that it was protected under the First Amendment. The decision marked the first time the United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of homosexuals. An important date in American LGBTQ plus history is January 1st of 1962. On that day at Illinois law that was passed in July of 1961 went into effect. The legislation repealed its sodomy laws, becoming the first US state 
to decriminalize homosexuality. Uh, there was one caveat, quote unquote, lewd fondling or caressing, whatever that might mean, between persons of the same sex in public spaces remained illegal until 1984. But for the time being, beginning January of 1962, what persons did in the privacy of their bedrooms in Illinois was no one else's business. On the 4th of July in 1965, Picketers staged the first Reminder Day by Independence Hall in Philadelphia. The event's purpose, Reminder Day, was to call public attention, to remind them, of the lack of civil rights provided to LGBTQ plus people. The gatherings in Philadelphia continued annually for five more years until the Stonewall riots in 1969 uh, changed everything. Now, in April of 1966, three years before the Stonewall riots, a trio of gay rights activists from the Mattachine Society staged a small but significant protest at Julius's bar in Greenwich Village, which you see on your screen, where today the bar is recognized, perhaps you can see from that little plaque over here on your far right, uh, where today the bar is recognized as a historic site by the National Park Service. Well, back in 1966, the three men took their seats at the bar, informed the bartender of their sexual orientation, and ordered drinks. Now, this was a radical act at the time. Many bars were refusing to serve openly gay customers, and New York City cops routinely raided gay bars, which were threatened with liquor license revocation for gay activity. Well, Julius refused to serve the men that day. And Village Voice photographer Fred W. McDera captured the exact moment when the barkeep put his hand over a glass to take it away. And you see that famous photograph on your screen. Following what has since been called the sip-in, uh, the Mattachine Society sued the New York Liquor Authority. Now, although no laws were overturned, the New York City Commission on Human Rights declared that homosexuals did have the right to be served. Uh, that event, uh, the sip-in, uh, has been celebrated regularly at Julius's ever since, as this recent photo with different people uh, testifies. Four months after the sip-in, on a warm August evening in 1966, a group of transgender customers became a bit too raucous in a 24-hour San Francisco cafeteria called Gene Compton's. The management decided to call the police. When police officers manhandled one of the patrons, she threw coffee in his face and a riot ensued, eventually spilling out onto the street, destroying police and public property. Following the riots, activists, uh, uh, th th this riot, singular riot, just one, uh, activists established the National Transsexual Counseling Unit, the first peer-run support and advocacy group organization in the world. So the few highlighted events that I've shared with you thus far become the prelude to the events of June 28th, 1969, the Stonewall riots. So um, Compton's was a riot, singular, Stonewall, plural, and I'll explain why in a moment. As a very young and very closeted gay man who had just graduated from high school that long, hot summer before I began my university studies, well, it was an eventful summer indeed. Shortly after my graduation, one of my gay icons, Judy Garland, died. Uh, then came Stonewall. Then came the first Apollo moon landing and 
a sex scandal involving Ted Kennedy. And then came the Manson murders and the Woodstock Music Festival. And poured over all of those events was the rancid poison of the Vietnam War, surreally juxtapositioned with the uh, amazing Mets winning the World Series. Now, all of this history poured over me like a tidal wave of feelings. But the one event with the longest effect was Stonewall. Stonewall eventually gave me the courage to be who I am. And to this day, I visit the site of the riots in the same way that some people make pilgrimages to holy sites. Simply put, I was and am changed by Stonewall. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you a short video uh, from the History Channel that succinctly summarizes June 28, 1969, and its importance to America's civil rights for all of its citizens. Now, you may have to adjust the sound on your devices. And uh, put it full. Speed. In the early morning hours of June 28, 1969, a riot broke out in front of the Stonewall Inn in New York City. The violent protest became known as the Stonewall Riots. The Stonewall Riots were a watershed moment in the gay rights movement, sparking activism and awareness across the United States. We'll look at the roots of the riots, the events, and their lasting impact. In the 1950s and 60s, homosexuality was still considered sodomy and illegal in 49 states. The punishments varied greatly by state, ranging from heavy fines to imprisonment. In society, members of the gay community were often subject to violence, harassment, and discrimination. In New York City, gay bars were havens for people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities, places where they could avoid harassment and violence. The Stonewall Inn served as a popular refuge. The Stonewall Inn was owned by the Mafia. The Mafia bribed the police to look the other way. In turn, the Mafia made money overcharging patrons for drinks. Even so, the patrons were not fully safe from homophobia and discrimination. The Mafia would extort wealthy patrons, threatening to out them to their employers and families. Despite the Mafia's bribes, the police still regularly raided the Stonewall Inn and other gay bars, charging them with solicitation of homosexual relations. Trans and other gender non-conforming people were also targeted, subjected to violence, and arrested if they weren't wearing what the police deemed gender-appropriate clothing. This oppression and mistreatment came to a head in the early morning hours of June 28, 1969. Nine police officers entered the Stonewall Inn in a raid. The patrons were fed up. As the police roughly tried to arrest bartenders and customers, many resisted. Outside the bar, people in the hundreds began rioting. They threw bottles at the police and pushed through the barricades. The police officers retreated from the crowd and locked themselves inside the Stonewall Inn. Rioters responded by setting the bar on fire. Police reinforcement arrived, and the original officers managed to get out of the burning bar. Meanwhile, the angry mob had grown into thousands. Eventually, the police were able to get the crowd to disperse, but it didn't last long. The riots continued until July 1st. While some criticized the violent and destructive riots, others pointed to the brutality and unjust treatment of the gay community. This large-scale defiance made a massive impact on society. The Stonewall Riots were the beginning of the modern gay liberation movement, which also brought attention to others marginalized for their sexual or gender orientation. The riots sparked the formation of the Gay Liberation Front, the first group to publicly advocate for equal gay rights. On the one-year anniversary of the riots, they also organized the first Gay Pride Parade. Today, Pride events are still held on the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots in cities around the country and even the world. In 2016, President Obama made the Stonewall Inn and the area outside where the riots broke out a national monument. This became the first national monument celebrating gay history. The Stonewall Riots may have been violent, but they marked a pivotal moment in history. 
No longer would people quietly endure the stigma associated with their sexual and gender orientations. Through the Stonewall riots, the gay rights movement gained mainstream visibility and a momentum that continues to this day. All right, there we go. And let me get us back to our screen. So the reason it's plural riots is because it started on the 28th and then for the next three nights after that, so four nights total, there were four separate cases of rioting until July the 1st. Now, on a recent trip back to New York to continue my work at the American Museum of Natural History, my husband Michael and I were able to soak in this historic and spiritual place. Meet my wonderful husband, Michael. If it weren't for Stonewall and all the struggles that followed, both on a social and personal level, I wouldn't have met this wonderful man in my life. And we're 15 years together and 10 years married. Now in the park across from the Stonewall Inn, a famous grouping of statues was unveiled in 1992. Created by the artist George Siegel, the four figures are an homage to what was once called the gay liberation movement. Now, here's the monument today, which is an official national monument. Um, it's currently undergoing a major facelift that will be finished in June of, of 2024, just in time for the opening on June 28th. Uh, of the Stonewall National Monument Visitor Center. Who would have thought that a mafia-owned bar would become such a nearly sacred site for untold millions of people in our country and around the world? Now, to round out the story of the actual Stonewall event, I thought you might enjoy this CBS video um, that commemorated the 50th anniversary of Stonewall back in 2019. Now, after we're done watching this, what I'll do is I'll explore with you the post Stonewall heritage. As far as this video, once again, you may have to adjust the sound on your devices. Today marks 50 years since the start of riots at the Stonewall Inn in New York City. A police raid led to a backlash that fueled the modern day gay rights movement. CTM lead national correspondent, that's David Begno, is at the Stonewall Inn with the story of two men who witnessed that raid and the clashes that followed. David, good morning to you. Gail, good morning to you. It happened in 1969, and you know who did it? The NYPD's Public Morals Squad. That was a thing back then. They raided the bar, but Gay bars were commonly raided during that time period. What happened that was different was as the patrons were kicked out onto the street, they started to fight back. They picked up everything they could on the street and just started throwing it at the bar. And that led to the movement which spread nationally. There was a bartender who was there that night, still works in the bar today. We start our story with him. Hi, David. How you Very doing? nice to meet you. Same here. He calls himself Tree Sequoia. He was a 30-year-old bartender when police raided the Stonewall. We knew it was another raid when all of a sudden we heard a crash and somebody threw a rock through the window. But this time, Stonewall patrons resisted arrest. The violence escalated and eventually hundreds of people joined in. Mark Siegel was there too. Stonewall turned him into an activist. From the very first day it was, uh, we're going to take back our identity. We're no longer going to allow society to label us. We will be out loud and proud and in your face. In 1973, Siegel stormed a live broadcast of the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. He held a sign saying, Gays protest CBS prejudice, a message seen by millions of viewers. But Cronkite heard his message. The homosexual men and women have organized to fight for acceptance and respectability. Gay people have the same right. Months later, CBS became one of the first networks to discuss gay rights. Just recently, the NYPD Commissioner James O'Neill apologized to the gay community. The actions and the laws were discriminatory and oppressive. Do you remember where you were when you decided I have to do this? I wasn't sure I was going to do it until I got up to the podium, quite frankly. I said, you know, this, is, this has to be done. Otherwise, uh, 
New York City is not going to be the place that it needs to be. Despite the progress made since the riots, statistics show that tolerance for LGBTQ Americans, particularly among young people, has sharply decreased from 63% in 2016 to 45% last year. A special bar Sarah Kate Ellis is president of GLAAD, one of the nation's leading gay rights advocacy organizations. Finish this for me. Our story today is is about joining forces with all marginalized people. Since Stonewall, pride has been a looking glass. For 28-year-old Raymond Braun, the Stonewall riots are history, but it's an event that motivated him to travel around the country to places like Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a city that held its first gay pride parade in 2014, a journey documented in the film State of Pride. We should be thinking about prides in literally every community. Even if 20 people show up, it's a couple rainbow flags and a picnic table, that's important. You can't legislate acceptance. If you are not accepted, you are not safe, and you are not going to move through this world with the same rights, no matter what, as anybody else. Our stories are our most powerful tools for building acceptance. You know, in 2016, President Obama declared the Stonewall in a national monument. So the Gay Pride March here in New York City happens on Sunday, and it coincides with World Pride. More than two and a half million people are expected. Tony, I will leave you with this. Mark Siegel, who you saw in the story, who interrupted Walter Cronkite's newscast, said to me this week when I interviewed him, he said, David, if you remember nothing else, remember this. Pride means visibility. Okay, that's a great little uh, report there. And again, it, it fills you in uh, on the actual event. Let me go back to my screen. Well, now let's look at what happened as a result of all of this. Well, on June the 28th of 1970, one year later to the date, a mass gathering called Christopher, Saint, uh, Christopher Street Liberation Day uh, commemorated the one year anniversary of the Stonewall riots. Following the event, thousands of members of the LGBTQ plus community marched through New York into Central Park in what would be considered America's first gay pride parade. Now, in coming decades, the commemoration of the Stonewall riots became a matter of showing pride in who we are as human beings. An ongoing tradition of annual festivals, usually in June, uh, that highlight the LGBTQ plus community, its joys, and triumphs. They see it as a means to call attention to issues vital to the LGBTQ plus community, uh, such as the AIDS pandemic, especially in the 1980s and the 1990s. Indeed, Stonewall started a worldwide revolution that continues to focus year round on human rights for everyone. In places like London, in 1971, here was their pride parade. And more recently in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, Bangkok, Thailand, Melbourne, Australia, Paris, France, Rio de Janeiro, San Francisco, and even Tel Aviv, Israel just to name a few places across the globe that continue to have pride festivals during Pride Month, usually in June. Meanwhile, back in the United States, on December the 15th of 1973, the governing board of the American Psychiatric Association voted to remove homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. This was indeed a major breakthrough for the LGBTQ plus community. Suddenly, we were no longer sick men and women. We were, to quote Lady Gaga, born this way. For many of us, including me, this was a day to celebrate. I remember vividly reading that in the paper. And though I was not out, inside I just felt such a sigh of relief. Okay, this is one more barrier that's gone. Well, less than four months at later, in April of 1974, Kathy Kozinchenko became the first openly gay American to be elected 
to public office in the United States when she won a seat on the city council of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, but there's always been resistance to civil and equal rights movements. In June of 1977, singer and conservative Southern Baptist Anita Bryan led a successful campaign with the Save Our Children crusade to repeal a gay rights ordinance in Dade, Dade County, Florida. Now, as an immediate result, Bryan faced a severe backlash from gay rights and human rights supporters across the United States, including a now famous pie in the face news conference in October of 1977. Unfortunately, the gay rights ordinance wasn't reinstated in Dade County until December the 1st of 1998, nearly 20 years later. And now we'll talk more about Florida in a little bit. But if Anita was the big news of the summer of 1977, Harvey Milk became even bigger news in November of 1977. Milk won a seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and was responsible for introducing a gay rights ordinance uh, protecting gays and lesbians from being fired from their jobs. Milk also led a successful campaign against Proposition 6, an initiative forbidding homosexual teachers in San Francisco. Unfortunately, a year later, on November the 27th of 1978, former city supervisor Dan White assassinated Milk, along with George Moscone, the mayor of San Francisco. In 1979, Dan White was convicted of voluntary manslaughter rather than first-degree murder and was sentenced to only seven years in prison. Uh, the reason turned out to be what is now called in legal circles, the Twinkie defense. A testifying psychiatrist at the murder trial suggested that White's consumption of sugary foods such as Twinkies led to his having diminished capacity. Using this testimony, White's lawyer was, su was successfully able to persuade the jury that White lacked the premeditation and deliberation elements necessary to establish a first degree murder conviction. As a result, White was ultimately convicted of that lighter offense of involuntary manslaughter. Well, outraged by what they believed to be a lenient sentence, more than 5,000 protesters, both gay and straight, ransacked San Francisco City Hall, doing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage in the surrounding area. But the following night, on October the 14th, approximately 10,000 people gathered on San Francisco's Castro and Market Streets for a peaceful demonstration. They marched uh, to City Hall in, to commemorate what would have been Harvey Milk's 49th birthday. Meanwhile, Dan White served out his seven year prison sentence, but ultimately committed suicide in 1985. Now, on the same night as that peaceful march in San Francisco was taking place, October the 14th of 1979, an estimated 75,000 people participated in the National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. LGBTQ plus people and straight allies demanded equal civil rights and urged for the passage of protective civil rights legislation. 10 years after Stonewall, our voices were starting to have a very visible impact. And that impact hit a milestone on July the 8th of 1980, when the Democratic Rules Committee stated that the party would not discriminate against homosexuals. As a result, at their national convention held at Madison Square Garden, New York City, on August 11th through the 14th, 
of 1980, the Democrats became the first major political party in America in history to endorse a homosexual rights platform. Well, there were some darker days ahead. On July the 3rd of 1981, the New York Times printed the first story of a rare pneumonia and skin cancer found in 41 gay men in New York and San Francisco. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, initially referred to the disease as GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Disorder. So keep that piece in your mind. On a more positive note, in February of 1982, Wisconsin became the first U.S. state to outlaw discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And on your screen, you see Governor Lee Dreyfus signing the bill into law. But picking up again on our uh, AIDS story, 1982, it was important for the LGBTQ plus community for another landmark decision. When the symptoms for the deadly virus were found outside the gay community, Bruce Voller, biologist and founder of the gay, uh, National Gay Task Force, successfully had the CDC change the name of the disease from gay-related immune deficiency disorder to AIDS, acquired immune deficiency disorder or syndrome, I should say. In March of 1987, the AIDS advocacy group ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, was formed in response to the devastating effects the disease had had on the gay and lesbian community in New York. The group held demonstrations against pharmaceutical companies profiteering from AIDS-related drugs like AZT, as well as the lack of AIDS policies protecting patients from outrageous prescription prices. Larry Kramer, the founder of ACT UP, became one of the leading activist voices of his generation. Earlier in 1982, he co-founded the Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York, which has since become the world's largest private organization assisting people living with AIDS. He expressed his frustration over the pandemic in his award-winning play, The Normal Heart, produced at the Public Theater in New York City in 1985. His involvement with ACT UP has been widely credited with changing public health policy, and the perception of people living with AIDS, as well as the LGBTQ plus community in general. Kramer went on to become a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for his play, The Destiny of Me, for which he won an Obie Award in 1992. Meanwhile, a few months after the founding of ACT UP, Hundreds of thousands of activists took part in the National March on Washington to demand that President Ronald Reagan address the AIDS crisis. He eventually did speak about the pandemic, but many activists weren't satisfied with his less than vigorous support for research and a cure. Meanwhile, the March on Washington also became the first time the National AIDS uh, Memorial Quilt was put on display, which became the basis for an Academy Award-winning documentary called Common Threads, Stories from the Quilt. Today, the AIDS Memorial Quilt is an epic 54-ton tapestry that includes nearly 50,000 panels dedicated to more than 110,000 individuals. It is the premier symbol of the AIDS pandemic, a living memorial to a generation lost to AIDS and an important HIV prevention education tool. 
uh, you can find out more about the quilt by visiting my website. Now, during the months of May and June in 1988, the CDC mailed a brochure titled Understanding AIDS to nearly every household in the U.S. Approximately 107 million brochures were mailed. And in that same year, 1988, the World Health Organization organized what would become the first World AIDS Day to raise awareness of the spreading pandemic. Two years later, President George H.W. Bush signed the Ryan White Care Act in August of 1990, a federally funded program for people living with AIDS. Ryan White, an Indiana teenager, contracted AIDS in 1984 through a tainted hemophilia treatment. After being barred from attending school because of his HIV positive status, Ryan White became a well-known activist for AIDS research and anti-discrimination. He passed away in April of 1990, but his act, signed in that same year, remains his legacy as well as a piece of landmark legislation. The following year, 1991. In 1991, a group of activists came together to create a meaningful symbol at the height of the AIDS crisis, to show support and compassion for those with AIDS and their caregivers. Uh, these artists were a part of the Visual AIDS Artist Caucus, and what they created was titled The Ribbon Project. Through a series of meetings in April and May of 1991, the Red Ribbon was born. The color red was chosen for its connection to blood and the idea of passion, not only anger, but love. And the ribbon format was selected in part because it was easy to recreate and wear. The Red Ribbon is now uh, the universally recognized symbol for AIDS awareness and compassion. Angels in America, a Gay Fantasia on National Themes, is a two-part play by American playwright Tony Kushner. The work won numerous awards, including the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, the Tony Award for Best Play, and the Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Play. Part one of the play premiered in 1991, followed by part two in 1992, and its spectacular Broadway opening took place in 1993. The play is a complex, often metaphorical, and at times symbolic examination of AIDS and homosexuality in America in the 1980s. Since its pre uh, premiere, many literary uh, scholars have called Angels in America, quote unquote, a turning point in the history of gay drama, the history of American drama, and of American literary culture. In December of 1993, the Department of Defense issued a directive prohibiting the U.S. military from barring applicants from service based on their sexual orientation. Okay, on paper, that sounds good. The new policy stated that, quote, applicants shall not be asked or required to reveal whether they are homosexual. But, and here's the tough part, the new directive still prohibited applicants from engaging in homosexual acts or making a statement that he or she was homosexual. Overt homosexuality could still result in dismissal. So this policy became known as don't ask, don't tell. Now shifting gears back to AIDS for a moment. In 1996, a combination drug treatment known as the AIDS cocktail was introduced, thanks to the Herculean efforts of Dr. David Ho and his team at Columbia University. This huge breakthrough became the beginning of many successful treatments that helped tens of millions of people across the planet. In 
In the case of Romer versus Evans, the United States Supreme Court in May of 1996 decided that Colorado's Second Amendment, which denied gays and lesbians protections against discrimination, was unconstitutional. In a six to three decision, the court held that Amendment 2 of the Colorado State Constitution violated the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. Colorado's Amendment 2 singled out homosexual and bisexual persons, imposing on them a broad disability by denying them the right to seek and receive specific legal protection from discrimination. The majority opinion was written by Justice Kennedy. The minority opinion was by Justice Scalia. Well, unfortunately, after the Supreme Court victory in May, there came a much darker moment for the LGBTQ plus community. On September the 21st of 1996, President Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act into law. The law defined marriage as a legal union between one man and one woman, and that no state would be required to recognize a same-sex marriage from out of state. Moving forward, October 1998. On October the 7th of that year, Matthew Shepard, a 21-year-old student at the University of Wyoming was brutally attacked and tied to a fence in a field outside of Laramie, Wyoming, and left to die. On October the he died there on October the 12th, succumbing to his wounds in a hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado. His death quickly became a rallying point for the LGBTQ plus community and became the inspiration for an award-winning film and a Broadway play that was also filmed and continues to be performed around the world. But within two years of the Matthew Shepard tragedy, there was a remarkable victory. In April of 2000, Vermont became the first state in the United States to legalize civil unions and registered partnerships between same-sex couples. Over the next few years, thousands of queer couples from around the nation went to Vermont to formalize their union, even if those unions weren't always recognized in other states. Now, one of the biggest post-Stone Wall breakthroughs happened on June the 26th of 2003, when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Lawrence versus Texas that sodomy laws in the entire of the United States were unconstitutional. So not only weren't we mentally ill, but we weren't doing something illegal when we expressed our love physically. Less than a year after that, on May the 17th of 2004, Massachusetts became the first state to legalize same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court of the Commonwealth declared that the prohibition of gay marriage was unconstitutional because it denied dignity and equality of all individuals. Within the next six years, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., and even the state of Iowa followed suit. Another post-Stonewall event that illustrated progress in the political arena happened on August the 9th of 2007, when the human rights campaign and the gay-owned and operated cable network Logo hosted the first ever American presidential forum focusing specifically on LGBTQ plus issues, inviting each presidential candidate. Six Democrats chose to participate in the forum, including Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. All of the Republican candidates declined to attend. But not all was positive in the political arena. On November the 4th of 2008, 
California voters approved Proposition 8, making same-sex marriage in California illegal. The passing of the ballot garnered national attention from gay rights supporters across the U.S. Proposition 8 was ultimately ruled unconstitutional uh, by a federal court in 2010, although the court decision did not go into full effect until June of 2013, following the conclusion of appeals by various religious and political groups. On June the 17th of 2009, President Obama signed a presidential memorandum allowing same-sex partners of federal employees to receive certain benefits. But several of the nation's most prominent gay and lesbian political leaders quickly attacked the president for failing to extend full health care benefits to the same-sex partners of federal workers, questioning the administration's explanation that it was precluded from doing so by the Defense of Marriage Act, which Mr. Obama had vowed to repeal during his presidential campaign. The passage of the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act in October of 2009 was a significant victory in the fight for equality in the LGBTQ plus community. The legislation was signed immediately by President Obama, and he therefore regained much credibility among the LGBTQ plus community. The expansion of hate crimes protections at the federal level sent an important message to our nation that the federal government would not tolerate uh, crimes that target individuals because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or other characteristics like disability, race, or gender. Well, on December the 18th, another victory. December the 18th of 2010, the U.S. Senate voted 65 to 31 to repeal the don't ask, don't tell policy, allowing gays and lesbians to serve openly in the U.S. military. President Obama signed the bill into law, once again proving him to be one of the most forceful presidential allies the country had ever seen. On June 24th of 2011, New York State passed the Marriage Equity Act, uh, becoming the largest state thus far to legalize gay marriage. Governor Andrew Cuomo was quick to sign it. Marriage equality was clearly gaining momentum across the country. Now, what that meant for people like me and my partner, Michael, was that we could go to City Hall and get our marriage license and have a wonderful wedding in June of 2013, planned by our co-workers. And you can see they even made us a lovely cake. In February of 2011, President Obama declared that his administration would no longer support the Defense of Marriage Act. Now, it took another four years, but on June the 26th of 2015, with a five to four decision in Obergefell versus Hodges, the U.S. Supreme Court declared same-sex marriage legal in all 50 states, thus once and for all making the Defense of Marriage Act null and void. But with the overturning of Roe v. Wade in 2022, many within the LGBTQ community became terrified that basic rights, including the right to marry the person you love regardless of their gender orientation or the color of their skin might be taken away. So in December of 2022, after passing in the Senate, the House passed a bill called the Respect for Marriage Act which protects both same-sex and interracial marriage in, land, in a landmark vote, sending it to President Biden. Biden and as you can see, he signed it immediately. Uh, but in many states, however, there are now fierce political battles being played out. In states uh, like Florida, for example, LGBTQ 
plus history can't be taught in public schools. And in places like Montana, well, huh, they have made transgender or being transgender a living hell, as state representative Zoe Zephyr can attest. There is resistance, but the struggle is bitter and sometimes violent. Indeed, this very presentation that you are watching today would not be allowed in a number of states in the United States right now in June of 2023. Now, it's also important to acknowledge that the struggle for LGBTQ rights within communities of color is just as vivid. If you are Black, Brown, or Asian, or Indian, to name just a few groups, or if you need support within your faith communities, your struggles and successes before and after Stonewall are very real. So, Let's hear it for Black performers, writers, and activists like RuPaul, Billy Porter, and Audre Lorde. For Representative Richie Torres, the first openly gay Afro-Latino elected to Congress, and for the journalist, writer, and leading Chinese-American activist, Helen Zia. For indigenous actor turned physician, Dr. Evan Adams, who is now the chief medical officer for the First Nations Health Authority in Canada. And trans-American Indian activist, scholar, and community organizer, Trudy Jackson, seen on your right. And how about the courage of Reverend Joseph Wallace Williams, who became the first black and openly gay head pastor at the Church of St. Luke and the Epiphany in Philadelphia, or theologian and activist Rabbi Lonnie Kleinman, and countless other clergy who put their faith and their orientation on the line almost every day. We need to acknowledge that all of these men and women, and untold thousands upon thousands more, that we don't have time to mention here of all races, creeds, and colors are fighting for civil and social rights for all human beings and not just in America. Indeed, across the world, the fight for LGBTQ plus rights is ongoing. Every country on this map that isn't colored green is a nation that is created and enforced some kind of law against people who identify as LGBTQ+. Now, as you can see, much of Africa and the Middle East are danger zones for people who don't identify as heterosexual. In fact, as recently as early 2023, Uganda passed a new law that criminalized homosexuality and other forms of so-called deviance. An accused person can now not only face years in prison, but also the death penalty. And that law went into effect uh, about a month ago. And that brings us back to the United States. While the effort of thousands of people before and after Stonewall has had a positive effect, there is a serious backlash in a number of American states where rampant prejudice and anti-gay religious fervor exists. But thanks to events like Stonewall, people today, gay and straight, are fighting back. So there's much to celebrate, but there's also a lot of work to do. And I hope that today's presentation has provided you not only with some history, but also some food for thought. Uh, remember, if you want to learn more, please go to my website, makingwings.net, and take deeper dive number 97. And now, as we look at the recently designed Progress Pride flag, it's time, as always, for your thoughts and ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was so much information. Um, 
I, I um, Claire, you can go first. I have questions, so go ahead. I, I don't have a question. <laughs> first, I must compliment the gentleman. This was the most well-informed presentation that I have heard in all the time we've been on Zoom. And Thank this you. brought together all that I remember because I know all about Stonewall and I've heard all about these legislations and everything else. The perspective I, I, that I gained today, I'm going to tell my kids to watch this so that they can, yes, get the same idea. All right. So I wanted to thank Bill so very much for thank doing you. this today. But also, Bill, I just must tell you something, okay? 